What a thrilling life awaits you. The acquisition of knowledge is a sacred activity. A truly educated man never ceases to learn. The future is in your hands. The outcome is up to you. This BYU devotional address with BYU President Cecil O. Samuelson and Sister Sharon Samuelson was given on September 4th, 2012. Today we're pleased to hear from President Cecil O. Samuelson and Sister Samuelson. Sister Samuelson is originally from Salt Lake City. Following her graduation in history education from the University of Utah, she taught school to help support her husband through his early years of medical school. For most of their married life, she has been a full-time homemaker and mother to their five children. She's been active in the community and has served in different capacities in all of the auxiliary organizations of the church. She and President Samuelson have 12 grandchildren. Those of you who attend BYU sporting events will know that she is an avid sports enthusiast. If you've had the privilege of sitting next to her, you will know that she is a very knowledgeable sports enthusiast. President Samuelson is also a Salt Lake City native who, was, who served at the University of Utah as Professor of Medicine, Dean of the School of Medicine, and Vice President of Health Sciences. Prior to his call as a full-time general authority, he was Senior Vice President of Intermountain Healthcare. He holds a bachelor's, degree of science, bachelor's of Science degree, a Master's degree in Educational Psychology, and a Medical degree from the University of Utah. He then furthered his medical education with postdoctoral work at Duke University. President Samuelson was called to serve as a member of the First Quorum of the Seventy in 1994. At the time of his assignment as 12th president of Brigham Young University, he was a member of the Presidency of the Seventy. On October 1st of this past year, he was granted General Authority Emeritus status. We look forward to hearing from the Samuelsons this morning and appreciate the positive influence they've had on BYU for the past almost 10 years. They are inspired leaders who are totally loyal to those whom we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. President and Sister Samuelson love the young adults of the church, and they love BYU. We're blessed to have them leading this great university. Now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from President and Sister Samuelson. Greetings and welcome to fall semester 2012. This assembly is a wonderful sight and I always enjoy greeting Brigham Young University students at the beginning of a new school year. You bring your talents, goals, experiences, and perceptions from homes, some merely a few blocks away from campus and others from far away places across the globe. Your classmates come from all 50 states, the District of Columbia, six territories, and 106 countries. Your desire to learn in an environment of faith will afford you many opportunities to teach and support each other as you become classmates, roommates, neighbors, leaders, listeners, mentors, and friends. Discover the world and all its wonders from each other. Contribute in as many positive ways as you can during your time here. And when you leave, take all you have experienced and go forth into the world, prepared to bless others with your acquired spiritual and temporal knowledge. One learns about so many varied aspects of life from different cultures and countries as well as their inhabitants. Mankind has always been filled with curiosity concerning unfamiliar peoples and territories. I can recall watching in awe as Neil Armstrong took his first steps on the moon over 43 years ago. Recently, we witnessed a rover landing millions of miles away on Mars, a planet that has continually fueled the imagination of science fiction writers as well as serious scientists. Now we await the pictures it sends to Earth to show what the red planet looks like and possibly find the answer to the question, could there be life or some form of intelligence on Mars? We are all fascinated by stories about the unknown and the dangers it may hold. Men and women throughout history have sought, often at peril to their lives, to explore mysterious and strange lands and places of which they had little or no information. These individuals would marvel at the use of a GPS, Google Earth, and MapQuest today. Historically, cartographers used their skills and limited knowledge to produce maps of their time period. These maps were not necessarily very accurate, 
but were archaic prototypes of those we use today. Found among myths and legends are stories of medieval European map makers placing the phrase, here be dragons, on the edges or other locations of their maps to indicate unknown, strange, and or dangerous areas. In other words, the end of the known world. Be if they did not know, and it was beyond their geographical knowledge, they put the warning, here be dragons. Dragons, sea serpents, and other mythical and frightening creatures were placed on later maps to warn people of areas to be avoided or entered into at their own risk. Sometimes the phrase might be included in writ and written in Latin or English. Why most often dragons? A dragon is a fearsome creature that appears in folklore in most countries. Haven't you all grown up with the stories of the brave and courageous knights fighting dragons to save the hapless princesses or dragons prowling the earth destroying villages and cities? I would surmise that some of your childhood nightmares included fire-breathing dragons chasing you through dense forests. Even though you have met timid, reluctant, and huggable dragons such as Puff in children's literature and movies, I think the fearful ones are those you probably remember the most and would want to give a wide berth to at all cost. Today, you are making decisions and choosing courses to take on the many maps and pathways presented to you. We read in the scriptures that Isaiah declared, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Our society seems to exemplify what is described in this scripture. The paths your lives take today have areas which could be marked by the phrase, Here be dragons, as a warning that you should and must avoid them. A firm testimony of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ is so necessary to maintain the proper perspectives and withstand the buffetings of the adversary which can and often will bombard you from all directions. What are some of the dragons that can have harmful effects if you venture into their territories of influence? The early explorers often lack the insight and knowledge about what they would find in the areas marked by dragons. But you young people have knowledge they didn't. You are warned by loved ones as well as prophets and other leaders concerning what may await you in these lairs. May I just mention some dragons I believe are tempting forces of destruction for each of you. The internet, social and other media can be dragons if they are not used properly. Speaking to a group of BYU Hawaii students, Elder M. Russell Ballard gave this warning. Now some of these tools, like any tool in an unpracticed or undisciplined hand, can be dangerous. The internet can be used to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and can just as easily be used to market the filth and sleaze of pornography. Computer applications like iTunes can be used to download uplifting and stirring music or the worst kind of antisocial lyrics full of profanity. Social networks on the web can be used to expand healthy friendships as easily as they can be used by predators trying to trap the unwary. There, that is no different from how people choose to use television or movies or even a library. Satan is always quick to exploit the negative power of new inventions, to spoil and degrade and to neutralize any effect for good. Make sure that the choices you make in the use of new media are choices that expand your mind, increase your opportunities, and feed your soul. You live in a world of technology and cannot avoid it with all the laptops, iPhones, iPads, iPods, and so forth that you find essential in your lives. I had a friend recently text me that she had just acquired an iPhone and hoped she could figure out how to use it. I sent her this picture taken of three of our grandchildren playing children's games on their parents' iPhones an iPad. I sent her the message that if these youngsters can do it, you can too. Now when our grandchildren come to visit us and after we share hellos, hugs, and kisses, they inevit inevitably ask, may I use your iPhone? This is not only our world today, but it is also a glimpse into the future where there will be inventions you cannot now envision. How will you use technology to bless your lives 
and also avoid the dragons it can represent. That is for you to decide. There is also the dragon of immorality. President Thomas S. Monson once stated that, you live in a world where moral values have in great measure been tossed aside, where sin is flagrantly on display, and where temptations to stray from the straight and narrow path surround you. Many are the voices telling you that you are far too provincial or that there is something wrong with you if you still believe there is such a thing as immoral behavior. The teachings and admonitions you have received up to this point in your lives are very clear on the importance of acceptable behavior in this area. Beware of being tempted into a dragon's lair in this area of your life. In our culture today, it seems that the traits of honesty and integrity are often lacking or absent in individuals, governments, politics, businesses, and even athletics. Unfortunately, honor, trustworthiness, and incorruptibility are traits that take a back seat to winning and aspirations of high position and or wealth. You have the choice to be honest and ethical or not. Remember the thought, here be dragons when you enter the realm where choices can lead to a path of dishonesty and lack of integrity. You have made covenants with your Heavenly Father to be honest. President James E. Faust once taught that honesty is a principle and we have our moral agency to determine how we will apply this principle. We have the agency to make choices, but ultimately we will be, un we will be accountable for each choice we make. We may deceive others, but there is one we will never deceive. From the Book of Mormon we learn, the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And there is none other way, save it be by the gate, for he cannot be deceived, for the Lord God is his name. My dear friends, be examples of honesty and integrity, wherever and in whatever you do. Brigham Young students are known for being examples of these attributes. Once when my husband had an important decision to make concerning a change in his professional path, he sought the advice of an individual he admired and respected concerning the matter. The counsel received was very short and concise. It was that, at all costs, he should protect his integrity. Once lost, your integrity and reputation for honesty are very difficult to regain. Steer clear of the dragons that would take them from you. You are blessed to have the teachings of the gospel to help you shy away from the areas where dangers and forces of evil can enter and put you in peril of losing your faith and testimonies. Sometimes you may think that you can get close to a dragon and escape in time because you are strong enough to fight him when necessary and can easily ignore any temptation he may place before you. Your curiosity and questions about the unknown may lead you to say to yourself, I can choose when to stop and turn around. I know I can. Do not be fooled. The adversary is deceptive and will seek to ensnare you with such thoughts. There is the oft-told story of three men who applied for the job of driving the coaches for a transportation company. The successful applicant would be driving over high and dangerous and precipitous mountain roads. Ask how well he could drive, the first one replied. I am a good, experienced driver. I can drive so close to the edge of the precipice that the wide metal tire of the vehicle will skirt the edge and never go off. That is good driving, said the employer. The second man boasted, oh, I can do better than that. I can drive so accurately that the tire of the vehicle will lap over half of the tire on the edge of the precipice and the other half in the air over the edge. The employer wondered what the third man could offer and was surprised and pleased to hear. Well, sir, I can keep just as far away from the edge as possible. It is needless to say which of the men got the job. You should be like the third driver. Just as he wisely chose to avoid danger, you should too. Hold on to the iron rod, the teachings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is your only way to have sure footings as you make your way on the roadways of life. Releasing your firm grip on it will surely put you in danger of being entangled in the river of water, the mist of darkness, 
or the great and spacious building as described by Lehi and Nephi. Their dragons, which were not too different from yours in this century, included the temptations of the adversary and the pride, wisdom, and vain imaginations of the world. Do not be fooled and lured by the dragons that will confront you as you make choices and decisions each day. It can be too easy to fall over the edge if you are not diligent in safely shunning it. If you find that you have indeed fallen over the edge or have become burned by the fires of a dragon, you are blessed with the knowledge that your Savior has given you his gift of the atonement. It is a message of love, hope, and mercy. He has provided a way for you to overcome any sins or their consequences. If you have entered an area where you were warned there were dragons, you do have a way to find the correct path out. And that is God's plan of salvation, which includes repentance and forgiveness. His love for each of you is boundless and provides a way for you to return to him. I have a testimony of the significance of the atonement and know that the Lord loves each and every one of you. He desires that you remain unwavering and firm in your testimonies of him and steadfast and immovable in your choices and behavior. I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. I appreciate this opportunity to add my welcome to Sister Samuelson for all of you who are gathered here today. She spends a lot of time chasing my dragons. At the beginning of a new semester is a season of anticipation, planning, excitement, and perhaps even a little trepidation for those adjusting to all that goes on in this very special place. We are very glad that you've chosen BYU and are qualified to be here. At Brigham Young University, we must always remember, reflect upon, and recall our fundamental purposes for being at this unique institution. As the semester progresses, all of us will likely be increasingly consumed with the demands and details of our daily tasks, which at least superficially are similar to or even much the same as we would encounter at another serious university. If we are not careful, papers, presentations, examinations, and other expectations will crowd out the higher or greater purposes for which BYU is established and the reasons for which we each decided to come and devote our time and energy. Over the years, I and many others have spoken at length and in some detail about the aims of a BYU education. I hope and expect we will continue to do so. I think virtually everyone seriously committed to BYU and our view of education will be able to recite without difficulty the expected outcomes of the BYU experience, which are that it should be spiritually strengthening, intellectually enlarging, and character building that then should lead to a lifetime of learning and service. Without apology, I recognize I have frequently emphasized the spiritually strengthening aspect of our efforts because it is unique in the world of higher education. Likewise, I have taken seriously and publicly the charge from our prophet leaders to make sure our academic and intellectual pursuits are of the highest order and quality. In addition, it is my perception that in our devotional activities, we are frequently reminded of the responsibilities and opportunities to provide meaningful service now and in the future. I continue to endorse and commend these initiatives and efforts. Today, I wish to focus my remarks on the importance of our individual character and what we need to do to build and to strengthen it as envisioned by the Savior and His duly elected and selected prophet leaders. There are, many there are many definitions of character, but one simple idea articulated by someone long ago seems most satisfactory to me. Quote, reputation is the opinion people have of a person, but character is what she or he really is. I hope in our time together this morning we can think carefully and seriously about what we really are and, more importantly, what we desire and need to become. I am satisfied that this aim of a BYU education to build character cannot be neglected or diminished because of all of the aims and mission of this great university are so intimately related to one another. While growing up, I remember the rather constant counsel from parents, teachers, church leaders and others to guard one's reputation. Most of us learned rather early that it was not a good thing to have a bad reputation about anything. While I still think this is good advice, I also believe that character, 
Real character is more important than just a good reputation. The reason for this assertion is that each of us is in complete control of our actual character. While public opinion, slander, and misrepresentation on the parts of others may influence one's reputation. For example, it is not too rare to learn in the media of someone with an apparently stellar reputation who has been found involved in a large variety of unsavory activities, which usually demonstrate that the person has taken advantage of another in ways unfair and often illegal. On the other side, there are those like the Prophet Joseph Smith and others even in our day who have impeccable character but suffer regular unfair and untrue assaults on their reputations. Such, for example, might occur during a political campaign. In a similar vein, I have always liked the observation made in various settings by Elder Neil A. Maxwell that, quote, it is better to have character than to be one, close quote. I admit that some of my favorite people are both. As a young man, I was impressed by the comments often made by President David O. McKay about the importance of good character. Let me share just a couple of examples. First, in answer to the question, what do you consider is the most important purpose of life, he responded, to develop a noble character. Second, a statement very close to home as we think about the aims of a BYU education. Said he, Character is the aim of a true education, and science, history, and literature are but means used to accomplish this desired end. Character is not the result of chance, but of continuous right thinking and right acting. True education seeks to make men and women not only good mathematicians, proficient linguists, profound scientists, or brilliant literary lights, but also honest men and women with virtue, temperance, and brotherly love. It seeks to make men and women who prize truth, justice, wisdom, benevolence, and self-control as the choicest acquisitions of a successful life." Close quote. I believe it fair to say that President McKay felt character building was of equal rank with spiritual strengthening and intellectually enlarging as primary educational goals for both institutions and individuals. From the very beginning, this attitude has also prevailed with the administration and faculty of BYU. Carl G. Mazur was known for his deep, unswerving commitment to all three legs of the BYU stool that are now known as our aims. As was the case then and so it remains today, our students, staff, and faculty do not arrive as blank pages, and so we must always give great credit to families, preparatory schools, and the church for the quality of people who come and so readily adopt the aims of a BYU education, including the necessity of character building. One such product of the early Brigham Young Academy was James E. Talmadge. He was recognized quickly for his great intellect, spiritual strength, and outstanding character. As he concluded his studies at BYU, BYA in those days, he became a member of the faculty and then left for a few years to obtain his graduate education at Lehigh University and Johns Hopkins University before returning to BYA and church education. Of course, his crowning appointment was to serve as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, and his many contributions are widely known and appreciated throughout the Church. Jesus the Christ and the Articles of Faith are two books that continue to be classics in Church literature and deserve our careful and regular study in our library of best books. Two accounts of his character, and even perhaps showing that he is also, was also a character, are found in the Talmud story, the biography written by his son John. They have become favorites of mine over many years, and some of you are likely familiar with these experiences. I believe they deserve retelling because they not only reveal much about Brother Talmadge, but also give significant insights into the important dimensions of, of character. Let me go directly to the experiences as young Brother Talmadge recorded them. Both occurred when James Talmadge was a mature man. The first was shortly after he left the church educational system and became president of the University of Utah at the encouragement of the First Presidency. He had obtained a bicycle, which was then the newest fad in transportation during the 1890s. These are the words of his son. James acquired one of the new machines, not as a hobby or physical conditioner, but as a practical means of transportation. Sometime after James had achieved reasonable proficiency in handling his machine on standard roads, he showed up at the front door one evening a full hour late for dinner and scarcely recognizable. 
May, his wife, nearly went into shock, for her husband was a frightening sight. Battered, bruised, and bleeding profusely, clothes torn in a dozen places and covered with dust and mud, James looked as though he had been caught in a riot, or at least a fight of unusual violence. Neither, it developed, had been the case. Half a block from the Talmadge home, a single plank footbridge crossed the ditch of running water that had separated the street from the footpath. Until now, James had dismounted when he reached this point in a homeward journey and crossed the narrow bridge on foot. Today, he had decided that he had reached the point in his development as a cyclist where he should no longer resort to this prudent maneuver, but rather ride over the bridge in the manner of an accomplished veteran of the two-wheeler. Having so decided, James approached the bridge resolutely, confident that he would negotiate the tricky passage in a manner to be proud of and to impress the neighbors, if any should chance to be watching, with his skill and casual daring. He turned sharply from the road toward the bridge with scarcely any diminution of speed. The result was spectacular, and observers, if any there were, must have indeed been impressed, but in a very different way from that intended. The professor's bicycle went onto the plank at an oblique angle and quickly slid off the side, throwing the rider heavily into the ditch. Dazed, bruised, and bleeding, and humiliated, Dr. Talmadge was not convinced that the difficult maneuver was beyond his skill. <laughs> Rather, he was stubbornly determined to prove that he could and would master the difficulty. For the next hour, James might have been observed trundling his bicycle 50 yards or so down the road from the bridge, mounting and riding furiously toward the plank crossing, turning onto it with grim lip determination, and plunging off it in a spectacular and bone-shaking crash into the rough ditch bank. <laughs> Uncounted times this startling performance is repeated, but in the end, mind triumphed over matter, willpower over faltering reflexes, and the crossing was successfully made. Not just once, but enough times in succession to convince James that he was capable of performing the feat without any mishap at any time he might desire to do so. From then on, he never again dismounted to cross the bridge, albeit he never made the crossing without experiencing deep-seated qualms, which he kept carefully concealed from many who might be watching." Close quote. <laughs> well, this is an interesting insight into a man who believes something, likely trivial to most people, was not only worth doing, but doing well. The same unfailing determination was demonstrated much later in a more widely recognized sense when Brother Talmadge literally lived in the Salt Lake Temple as he wrote his famous and beloved book, Jesus the Christ, at the direction of the First Presidency. His absolute commitment to completing a task he determined to be important, whatever anyone else might think, served him very well throughout his life and in turn blessed and continued to bless countless others. The other account I will share, which most will also likely find amusing, occurred while he was serving as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. Although usually a strength, his dogged determination and almost complete focus on his work was also a cause for worry on occasion, not only for his family, but also for the top leadership of the Church. Let me again return to the account recorded by John Talmadge, quote, in later years, James' long hours of work, unrelieved by periods of recreation, were cause for real concern among family, friends, and associates. President Heber J. Grant, the president of the church for one, repeatedly urged Dr. Talmadge to take up some form of sport, if only for its therapeutic value. Himself an enthusiastic golfer, President Grant tried to get his friend to try that sport, confident, as are all golfers, that if anyone were once thoroughly exposed to golf, he would be captivated by its subtle but powerful attractions. As President Grant's urgings increased in frequency and intensity, so did Dr. Talmadge's demurs on the grounds of lack of interest and lack of ability to master a complicated skill so late in life. President Grant was certain the skill could be mastered and that interest would automatically flow, follow. Finally, a compromise was reached and a test agreed upon. James would give the game of golf an honest trial and work at it until he was able to hit a drive which President Grant would rate as satisfactory, a real golf shot. If you hit just one really good drive, nature will do the rest, President Grant assured his pupil to be. You won't be able to resist the game after that. It was agreed that James would make his own choice after he had acquired the skill to hit the specified shot. 
If he felt the fascination of the game as President Grant was certain he would, he would take up golf and play with reasonable regularity. If after giving the game a fair trial, James still felt no interest, President Grant would cease his efforts to get Dr. Talmage to play. On an appointed day, the two, accompanied by a number of others of the general authorities who played golf and who had joined the friendly argument on the side of President Grant, proceeded to Nibberley Park in Salt Lake City for James' first session in which was expected to be a series of lessons. James removed his coat and was shown how to grip the club and take his stance at the ball. The coordinated movements involved in making a golf stroke were carefully explained and then demonstrated by President Grant and by others. Finally, it came James' turn to try it himself. What followed astonished all those who watched and probably James himself. Instead of missing the ball completely or weakly pushing it a few feet along the grass, James somehow managed to strike the ball cleanly and with substantial force. It took off in a fine arc and with only a minimal amount of slice. Some who saw it described it later as a truly magnificent drive which was probably a considerable exaggeration. However, there was consensus that the ball went close to 200 yards and stayed in the fairway. It was a drive that would gladden the heart of any golfer short of the expert class, and it bordered on the phenomenal for a novice. The spectators were momentarily struck dumb and then burst into enthusiastic applause. Congratulations, said President Grant, rushing forward, beaming, and with outstretched hand. That was a fine shot you will remember for the rest of your life. You mean that was a fully satisfactory golf shot, James asked cautiously. It was, certainly, said President Grant. Then I have fulfilled, then I have fulfilled my part of the agreement. President Grant said, you have, and don't you feel the thrill of excitement? Now you'll be playing regularly. As a matter of fact, we can go into the clubhouse now, and I will help you select a set of clubs. Thank you, said James, putting on his coat. If I have carried out my part of the agreement, then I shall call on you to live up to yours. You promised that if I hit a satisfactory drive and did not feel the spontaneous desire to play, you would stop urging me to do so. Now I should like to get back to the office where I have a great deal of work waiting, close quote. <laughs> so far as is known, James never again struck a golf ball or made the attempt. It is very clear that Brother Talmadge was always absolutely supportive and obedient to the prophet on matters of doctrine, principle, and church practice or procedure, but he did not consider his loyalty to the brethren to extend to their love of golf. Brother Talmadge was his own man, but he was also a man of impeccable character. He decided to do what he considered was really important and deflected those things of lesser or no priority. Perhaps there is a lesson here for us with respect to video games, social media, television, and other activities you might think about. At BYU, we have the good fortune of being surrounded by many impressive examples of people with genuine, sterling character. Might we each do what we must to ensure that our own personal character comes as close as possible to that of the Savior, whom we know to be a perfect character, even the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom I testify in his sacred name, Jesus Christ, amen. This BYU devotional address with BYU President Cecil O. Samuelson and Sister Sharon Samuelson was given on September 4th, 2012.